One of the privileges that Elizabeth and I have had is the privilege of, for ministry reasons, traveling in lots of different places in the world and finding ourselves not only in ministry, but with some opportunities to visit some places when we're there and to, to go. Now, you could put my knowledge of art in a thimble and still have lots of room left over, but had the privilege of standing in Florence looking at the David and recognizing the magnificence of Michelangelo or looking at the same man's work standing in the Sistine Chapel and looking at the ceiling or being in Amsterdam and in a museum and looking at the works of Rembrandt in all of its beauty or in the Louvre and looking at the Mona Lisa. But I must say I walk out of there recognizing those works as masterpieces and along the way find other paintings by acclaimed authors and having to walk away saying, I don't get it. Uh, I understand that Picasso was great, but I, uh, well, I've understood that masterpieces are defined in different ways, that they have to have stood the test of time that they have had to uh, show technical brilliance and skill, and they have to have changed the way people view things and reality around them in that particular way. And uh, that's what makes a masterpiece, so I'm told, in the art world. Well, this morning, we're going to look at a biblical masterpiece, the book of Ephesians. And over much of the rest of the year, we're going to be making our way into a book that has been called by Bible scholars. Well, one says, pound for pound, Ephesians is the most important document ever written. Another one says, it is one of the most important documents in all of history. Another person says, it is the Switzerland of Scripture, which in American terms is, it's the Grand Canyon of Scripture. And I like those images because when you see Switzerland and the towering mountains uh, or Banff in Canada, or if you come to the Grand Canyon, there's a sense of grandeur and magnificence and skill. And that's what the book of Ephesians does. It opens up for, the, for us the grandeur of God's work, the grandeur of God's purpose, the grandeur of God's son, the grandeur of God's grace and his purposes for the church. So we're going to begin to dip our toes in the book this morning, and I'd like you to take your Bibles to turn with me to Acts chapter 19. We're going to come to Ephesians a little bit later, but let's walk our way into the book by spending a little bit of time of thinking about just exactly where we are historically and physically as we open the book of Ephesians. Now... <clears throat> In Acts chapter 19, verse 1, we're only going to read a few verses. It says, it happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And then jumping over the intervening story, verse 8. He entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now, Asia, in that context, is a large central part of Turkey today. It's not Asia as we know it. Sometimes it's called Asia Minor, but, but think of Turkey, especially the western side of it. Elizabeth and I have had the privilege of being in Ephesus twice, and I can visualize in my mind walking down. It's a kind of unusual place in some ways. There's these magnificent ruins, kind of the major road through town. And as you go through on one side, there are some mansions that have just rather recently been excavated. And you walk in and you have some sense of the upper classes and all the 
glory and magnificence in which they lived. And you walk on the other side and you see some crafts and stores and other parts of it. And then a very well-preserved public toilet, which is very striking to see exactly what that involved at the time. And then off to the left, you get further a magnificent library, several stories high, magnificent in its glory, one of the greatest of its times. And then a little further down off to the right, a marvelously preserved arena that seats 25,000 people in which you can speak and you hear all of those. And then you walk through and then down about half a mile away, your bus stops by a field and you can see a few pillars in it where a temple once stood. Interesting thing is there isn't much else. That was one of the great cities of its day, but the river on which it was located, which made it a port city, silted up. And about a couple of hundred years after Paul was there, it became an empty city. Once glorious, now empty because the river had silted up and made it irrelevant. It couldn't function as a port any longer. But Ephesus was one of the four great cities of the time. Rome, obviously, Alexandria in Egypt, Antioch, just a little bit further south, and, Alex and Ephesus. It was a city of prominence. It was called the mother city of the area. The word mother city, you will recognize, mother, mater, polis metropolis and that's what it meant but it, what it meant was that it was the dominant city of that particular area the light of asia it was called so it was a political power and influencer because it kind of stood between the roman mediterranean and the inland area of the fertile crescent going back to persia in all of that particular area, and the world met there, and it was wealthy and powerful because it was a port, communicating those things back and forth in that way. So it was a city of influence, it was a city of commerce, the most, probably the, the wealthiest city in the world at that particular time, about 250,000 people living in the area in a number of other places, and servicing the whole area around it, and it was also a city of darkness spiritually because it was the home of the temple of Artemis. In uh, Greek, in Roman terms, uh, uh, Diana. And the phrase, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. She was one of the most powerful God figures in the ancient world, and her temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Four times larger than the Parthenon in Greece, with towers 60 feet high, with a magnificent meteorite in the middle surrounding it that had fallen from heaven. And that was what was the symbol of her power and her worship. And it was servicing the whole area. It was a center of banking that was in the temple. And it was a simple of business. And all of these other things were related to it. It was also a city of spiritual darkness beyond Artemis. Because it was known as a center of witchcraft and magic and oracles and all of those things. The Ephesian letters were, were a little kind of magical code that was used all around the ancient world at that time. So it had all of these things going for it. And in 52 AD, Paul found himself there for his first time. He had been in Corinth, which is in Greece, just to, coming to the coast now of Turkey, going to make his way down to Jerusalem. And he comes and... Uh, has Aquila and Priscilla with him, and they begin to form a little bit of a church, but it's just a visit. He leaves and then makes his way to Jerusalem. Just a short stop in that's mentioned at the end of chapter 18. But on the beginning of his third missionary journey, he makes his way 
first of all, to Ephesus. That's chapter 19. And he will spend two and a half years in Ephesus. And it will now become a center of his ministry in that particular time. And we'll come back and just notice it in a little bit. Then, in uh, the next chapter, after two years, he's forced to leave because, well, he chooses to leave because of a riot. Although the Christians are vindicated in the riot, but he knows his presence will just make it too difficult for others. He leaves and goes off and he heads back into Greece again. And he will make another visit, just a short one in Acts chapter 20, on his way to Jerusalem, just to finish the rest of the story, where he will take a gift to the believers and take some others, and he will be arrested for causing a riot, which he didn't cause, and ultimately he will be taken from there as a prisoner to Rome. So, that's sort of where we are. Now let's think about what happened, and you can see it in the passage we just read. He did what he nearly always does in a city, and that is he went to the synagogue, the Jewish center. It was a city, as I said, of about 250,000. It's estimated, given the way the dispersion of the Jews worked, that there were probably 20 to 25,000 Jewish people in the city at that time. And that's where his heart was. He was Jewish by background. He went into the synagogue. He was there for three months using it as a base. But apparently the hostility continued to grow as it nearly always did in there. And so he moved nearby to a school building. The the, uh, school of Tyrannus. Now, siesta was during the afternoon hours. And it seems that Paul went in when the normal siesta time was and the students weren't traveling normally and began to teach. And he used this building during that time for two years. And you'll notice what it says in verse 10, which is significant. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now, there's probably a little bit of hyperbole there, not meaning every single one, but it's saying the gospel became a power and a significance and a force, and it moved out into that area. And God was working. There's the next incident that's told in verses 11 to uh, 20 that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, any time on really, where uh, a miracle is done through some people who are practicing magic. And that impacted those who saw it uh, in such a significant way. Look at verse 19. That a number of those who practiced magic arts, of those who had believed, brought their books together, burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them, and it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, let's just pause here for a minute. Piece of silver is a day's wage. Just use the figure, day's wage in our modern world, low side, $100. $5 million worth of books burned and images by believers. That tells you, first of all, they've really been deep into that. And that was something of the background, and we'll see that reflected as we get into the book of Ephesians. There's a lot of talk about the powers of darkness and evil. But on the other side, it tells us there must have been a lot of believers in that particular pound, if 50,000 shekels. So the gospel had grown in significant ways, so much so that the next part of the story is business is dropping off at the temple of Artemis. And that inspires a riot on the part of the image makers and the people who are peddling and all of those kind of things. That attendance is dropping off and it's the Christians who are blamed for this, which again says something of the remarkable work that God is doing. And there's a riot in the town square and remarkably the town clerk says, Christians are right, leave them alone. And at that point, Paul leaves. That brings us to Ephesians chapter 1. So turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. God has done this 
significant work in the midst of that particular setting and brought into being a church and this is now six or seven years later. Paul has only made that one short visit in that interim and he's now in Rome as a prisoner and he writes this letter back to that church. Well, actually, it's not entirely clear. And I won't get into all of this. And there's some questions because of some Greek things, and I won't get into the question, but I think it's written to the church in Ephesus. Interesting, the oldest manuscripts we have leave, don't name, don't put Ephesus in at that point. But I, I think the more reasonable idea is this is how the book was always understood by the Christians as written to Ephesus. We'll take it that way. So let's read these first two verses in that context. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful, but I think it should read to the saints who are in Ephesus and believing in Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the interesting things about Ephesians as we read it, it's not nearly as personal as most of Paul's letters. And that's surprising because he spent more time there than he did in any of the others. In most of the letters that Paul writes, he'll name this person or that person or this person. He does refer to Tychicus at the end of the letter. Uh, Antichicus was the person who, who apparently carried the book of Ephesians with him, as well as the book of Colossians and the book of Philemon, when he came from Rome back to Turkey, as we know it today. So the letter seems to be intended to be a kind of general letter to people, many of them he's never met, because it's been six or seven years since he's been there. And the church has grown and it's spread in different places. So rather than being written to a congregation in Ephesus, it is being written to the church in Ephesus in a larger sense, a group of believers. And Paul begins by reminding them of something important. This is not just a letter from a friend, which it is. It is a letter from the apostle the apostle by the will of God. Now, uh, an apostle was an authorized representative of someone. And in this case, he's the authorized representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been commissioned to represent the Lord. And he speaks as the ambassador, the representative. Later in the book, Paul will come back to this and say, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles. So what he wants to remind them is this is not just a friendly letter to friends. In some way, this is the word of God. I'm speaking as God would have me speak. And I'm an apostle, not because I chose it myself, not because others appointed me to that position. I am an apostle by the will of God. Paul never got over that moment on the Damascus Road when the Lord appeared to him and commissioned him, not only called him to faith, but sent him to bear his name around the world and bear his gospel. Now, as I've already said, he reminds them three times that he is a prisoner. Chapter 3, verse 1, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner, of Jesus Christ on behalf of you Gentiles. Chapter four, verse one. I therefore a prisoner for the Lord. And chapter six in verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains. The mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. It's interesting, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he looks back on his time in Ephesus and he says, I fought wild beasts in Ephesus. Well, it could have meant that he was in the Colosseum or had something like that, but almost certainly he's referring to it metaphorically. I fought lions there. 
the gospel spread, but there was all kinds of opposition. But God had done a work. People had come to faith and trust in him. And so now Paul writes them in that very familiar kind of designation that we get used to the saints in Ephesus believing in Jesus Christ. Now they're faithful, but the emphasis of this word is they're people of faith. They've come to faith and trust. So their first mark is that they're saints. We have trouble with that because Roman Catholic tradition tells us saints are certain elevated kind of people who have special privileges, or we talk about somebody who's saintly as someone who's yeah, really spiritual, or anyway. But that's not what a saint is. A saint is someone in the Hebrew sense and in the Greek sense who's been set apart. And that's what Paul is saying. You are God's people. You've been set apart from God. You may not be saintly yet, but you are saints. You are God's own people. And you are believers in Christ. That is the basis of your having been separate. You are God's people by faith in Christ. And then he gives his very familiar greeting. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's been said, you've heard me say it, some of you before, that that kind of combines Greek, which used the word kyrene in Greek, kairos is the word for grace. Kyrene means greeting, kind of a shift, and they make it say that, the way that people would normally say that in Greek. In Hebrew, it was shalom, peace. So in some ways, it takes the familiar words of greeting and it reinvents them. But there's something more than that. Grace and peace are God's gifts to his people in Christ. And the order is important. It's because of God's grace, his goodness to us in Christ, apart from our merit, that we have peace. Peace with God so that our sins have been dealt with and peace from God so that we can trust him in our lives. So let me just back away from that. That's where we're going. And in verse 3, we have one of the great statements in all of Scripture. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's for next week. I want you to think with me about four things. There's many more, but I just have four that I want you to think about related to the book of Ephesians and what we are intended to hear as we move through this book. And this is obviously a list that could be extended, but just these four. First of all, what he wants us to understand is the sufficiency of God's grace in Christ. That grace becomes one of the key themes of the book. And if you think about Ephesians, they almost inevitably think of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. By grace, you're saved through faith. But Paul doesn't want us simply to know about God and his grace being there. He wants us to understand it's far more than that. So look with me at verse 7 of chapter 1. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Chapter 2, verse 4. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Verse 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the unmeasurable riches of his kindness in Christ. Chapter 3, verse Eight, to me, though I am the least of all the apostles, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Verse 14 of 3. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father for whom, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power by his, by his spirit in the inner man. The, the book of Ephesians isn't just about the grace of God, it's about the riches of his grace. It's about the 
fullness of the provision of all that he's done for us in Christ. It's also a book about the supremacy of the power of Christ. He, he will say, as he gets to chapter 7, or chapter 6, excuse me, that our, our wrestling, our, our, our spiritual battle isn't against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against spiritual forces of wickedness in high places. It was dark in Ephesus. You could cut the sense of the power of evil with a knife as you walk through the city. They worshipped before this and they viewed themselves as the temple keeper of the great Artemis and the Ephesian letters and the blackness of the occult. All of those things were part of the world in which they lived. And yet he wants them to know that Christ is incomparably greater. So look at chapter 1 just for a moment and verse 18. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened so that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you. What are the riches? There I missed riches in that one. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believed according to the working of his great might? that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the ages to come. And if you haven't got it yet, and he put all things under his feet and all things, and he's head over all things to the church, which is body, the fullness of him, who is all in all. You don't worship a small Savior, the supremacy of the Lord, he's head over all things and all the powers and all the forces. Yes, the world is evil. Yes, Putin's exist. Yes, Caesar exists. Yes, spiritual forces are real. But I want your eyes to be opened that in Christ, you are part of of what he is doing, and he is Lord over all. Third thing related to that, sufficiency of his grace, the supremacy of his power, and then as we look at this, the significance of the church. Because the book of Ephesians opens up an understanding of the church that hasn't quite been that clear. Up until now, every time Paul talks about the church, he tends to talk about a local congregation. The word church in Greek, ekklesia, means a gathering, a congregation, an assembly. And there were all these churches scattered in different places. But now in Ephesians, he doesn't talk about the church, small c. Now it's about the church, the body of Christ, the coming together of Jews and Gentiles, slave and free people from every generation, male and female, into God's new creation. And it's called by different terms. Sometimes it's called the body of Christ. And Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. And then it will be called the temple of God, and that we're built into the temple of God. And it will speak about it in a little bit lesser term as the people of God. And what he wants us to understand is we're just not a bunch of scattered things. God is doing something in the world and a new people have been brought into being, something that's never existed before. One of my favorite passages in the book is in verse 11 when he says, and the book is primarily written to Gentiles because they were in the majority of the church. At one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what's called the circumcision, which is made in flesh by hands. Remember, you were 
at that time separated from Christ, alien from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now, in Christ, you who are far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He is our peace. He overrules Jews and Gentiles. He overrules racial division. He overrules the idea that there are inferior and superior people or genders. The economic realities of the world. God is bringing into being a new people from all of the nations. And we come here for not a very large number. And we're not a very impressive number. We can look at the towering building on the hill and think, pretty small group in a city that's dominated by some other spiritual understandings of things. But we're part of the body of Christ. And God is knitting together his people that's larger than all the divisions. And in a divided country like ours, the gospel comes to us and says, get rid of all of that nonsense. There aren't Jews and Gentiles and there aren't people of color and people not of color. There aren't people who are worthy in terms of their own merit and people who ought to be disqualified. This isn't is a church. We're not Republicans or Democrats. We're God's people. And that's part of the new thing that God is doing. And in the church, all of those things are not allowed to be part of what's God because God, Christ is our peace who's brought something new into being. So one of the things this book will do is remind us of the nature of church. I missed one of the great analogies in all the Bible that the church is what? The bride of Christ. Who he is working to present before himself as a bride in all her glory. So that we're precious to God and we're God's people. So the sufficiency of Christ's grace, the supremacy of his power, the significance of his people, and one thing that doesn't quite fit, but we'll keep the S's together, the structure of Christian living. So I just want you to notice this as we conclude, because it's a powerful part of what he's saying. The central verse in the first three chapters of this book is chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with, in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We'll take next week to unpack some of what that means. But what happens in chapters 1, 2, and 3 is that we're reminded of our riches in Christ and all that is ours because of him. And it's about our position. It's because of what God has done. So everything in these first three chapters is talking about this is who you are in Christ. This is your position. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, I, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. There's the book. This is your calling, chapters 1 to 3. This is how you're to live. This is how you're to walk, chapter 4. Chapters 1 to 3, this is your position. Chapter 4, 5, 6, this is to be your practice. This is who you are. This is your standing in Christ. This is your responsibility in Christ. Now, why do I draw attention to that? Because that's the fundamental truth of the Christian life. You have to know who you are before you can understand how you are to live. And if you reverse those two, as many do, this is how you're to live, so you'll become 
What verses one to three? All kinds of people believe that if I do this, do this, do this, keep the commands, then I become. Rome, uh, Ephesians comes to us says, no, you become through faith in Christ. And now be this. Or to use grammatical terms, in the biblical world, the indicative, that is the statement what is, always is the basis of the imperative. So first of all, know that you are in Christ. Understand what that means. Now, he isn't meaning, okay, you've got to study verse three before you, chapters one to three before you start living like a Christian. But his point is, it's always your identity and being sure about your identity that is to inform your practice. And if your identity is in grace, then your practice will be led by grace, not by law, not by works, not by your effort. I uh, was reading in the city of Lviv in Ukraine, which is the one on the west closest to the border. They've uh, emptied the museums. They've taken all of the masterpieces that are related to a Ukraine and they've hidden them away. I don't know whether they've gotten them out of the country. I don't know where they are. Nobody except a very few does. And they've done it very quickly. One particular piece took six months to put together. They got it unraveled in six days and packed away. Because their masterpieces are part of their identity as Ukrainians and they don't want the Russians to steal those symbols of who they are. Art masterpieces are significant things and we can relate to them. And there are ones that are national, there are ones that take other forms. But God's masterpiece isn't a book, although the letter tells us something about it. It's the person of Christ and the gospel of salvation and a knowledge of all that he's done for us in Christ. We can go to the Louvre and we can sit there or stand there or shoulder our way through. If you've ever been to see the Mona Lisa, there's all kinds of people that you hardly get a chance to see it, just the heads of all the people in front of you. We can admire a masterpiece and go away saying, well, I checked that one off. But the purpose of God's masterpiece in the book of Ephesians is that seeing who Christ is and learning who we are will change us into being who we should be. The purpose of a masterpiece, humanly speaking, is what a great sculptor Michelangelo was. The purpose of scripture is to say what a great savior we have and to wonder at the goodness of God in Christ. Ephesians will help us do that. And the table helps us to do that because it brings us back to basics. I have a God who loved me like this. He gave his son for me and his son rose in power and ascended at the right hand of the Father in heaven, he gives grace and peace to all who trust in him. In him, as Paul says in verse seven, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. If you've not trusted Christ, then the central purpose of a book like Ephesians is what you're missing. So put your faith and trust in him. If you have trusted Christ, then we have the privilege of reminding ourselves again and reinforcing again the wonder of the riches, the unsearchable, inexpressible richesness of Christ in our place and on our behalf. We're going to sing in reminding ourselves of the gospel as the symbols are distributed and then we'll take them together after we've sung. Father,
I pray that as we come together in your presence to take these symbols as your son has asked us, you would fill us with wonder that your grace and peace has come to us through the gift of your son who bore our sins in his own body on the cross. Fill our hearts with praise as we sing and take these symbols in Christ's name. Amen.